They took Eric out of his arms and cuffed him and led him away. And he remembers Eric screaming, Daddy, Daddy, as he's taken away from his son. He lost his wife, his, <laughs> his love of his life, his college sweetheart. They were going to have this wonderful life together with their son. And it all ended when the monster came in the house. We believe that the murderer killed Christine and, ran, and, and wiped the, the, um, her blood from his face and hands and stuck the bandana in his back pocket and ran. And miracle of miracles, the bandana fell out as he was running and uh, became found as part of the crime scene evidence and should have been tested as soon as DNA testing was available. And we argued that it could have Christine's blood as well as the DNA of a person who was not Michael. And that person's DNA might lead to a hit on the data banks of a known offender. And we, had, we argued that in, in 2005. And in the summer of 2011, it was confirmed that those words were absolutely true. I remember, uh, prior to filing the motion, calling Mr. Bradley based on the advice of my father, who's a retired prosecutor, just to see if he would agree to the motion. He said it would muddy the waters. I've never forgotten that. And, and I didn't really understand what he meant. And I, I said, uh, Mr. Bradley, truth clarifies. It's never really been explained to me why the state would fight so hard against a simple test that wouldn't cost the state any money at all, that can only reveal the truth. I remember Mr. Bradley asking me in one of our early conversations, what would you do if the test results came out against your client? And I said, I would call him up and say, Michael, I've got some really bad news for you. The test results say this, and that is really harmful to any further efforts to, to exonerate you of this murder. Now, Mr. Bradley, let's turn it. What if the test results exonerated him? Because I can handle the truth. June of 2011, uh, the, the results started coming in. The first results were that it was Christine's blood, Christine's hair, and the DNA of a man, not a woman, a man who is not Michael Morton. Michael was excluded. Mr. Bradley throughout this was continuing to fight. September 26, 2011. That is the date that we were told by Judge Harl in open court that he'd received a call from Travis County law enforcement and it was about the link to Deborah Jan Baker. And I remember coming back in and saying, wow. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say, but wow. I said, this is powerful evidence that Michael Morton's third party intruder theory is absolutely true. And in light of this, we anticipate the state will want to discuss immediate terms of his release now, today. But they weren't, even then. Um, they continued to be resistant until um, early October. And I remember Barry Sheck saying, I've got a feeling that Bradley's going to turn, but I, I, none of us really believed it. And a really important conversation for me was <coughs> over two years ago when Michael said that he would, he understood that he would be paroled if he only showed remorse for his crime. 
And I, I, I said, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? I didn't feel like I could advise him on that because I mean, you know, 23 years now, I don't think anybody would have blamed him if he'd said, I'm really sorry, let me go, you know? But Michael is a man of great integrity and he w would not lie to get out of prison. And he, and he said, all I have left is my actual innocence. And if I have to be in prison the rest of my life, I'm not giving that up. And when he said that, I just felt this rush of emotion. And I said, Michael, I promise you, I will never quit. I think it's important to understand that Michael Morton, in order to get this investigation done, would have been willing to stay in prison another five months after being in for 25 years. It was that important to him to find out what happened and, um, and, and try to prevent it from happening to someone else. Michael is a very thoughtful, contemplative, reflective guy. I mean, he has a way of pausing to let things kind of be absorbed. I remember when I called to tell him about the DNA hit, and, I, well, on the, and there was silence on the other end of the line. And I said, Michael, are you, are you still there? I was afraid he might have fainted or something. And he said, I, I'm here, I'm just, I'm just letting this soak in. 25 years, he'd been waiting. I think it's important for our state and for our country, it should grasp all of us to make us realize that this could happen to us. Michael Morton is a, just a normal guy. He had no criminal record, no history of violence. What, manager of the Safeway, left the house at 5.30 in the morning to make sure the produce was laid out neatly in the rows, kissed his wife goodbye. 25 years. We should all try to do what we can to keep this from happening to others. And an analysis of these issues is part of it. Yes, files should always be open to the defense so that there's no evidence concealed from them. DNA testing on things that would have been tested if the crime happened today should be agreed to. Right now he's just enjoying life and he's seeing things with all the wonder that, that we, we haven't had in a long time really. <laughs> he, he, he told me later, his first night out when we went to a restaurant, it was the first time he'd held a metal fork and a knife and he wasn't quite sure he remembered how to do it. Little things like that. And he's just healing. Oh, I remember we got to the door of the courthouse and I said, I, I, I stopped him and, and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Michael, when we step outside, breathe freedom. <laughs> I've been waiting for seven years to say that. He'd been waiting 25. And so uh, we stepped out and he went, and he smiled and he breathed freedom in. <laughs> and uh, the sun came out and hit him in the, hit his face. It was so beautiful.